Well, today we're going to continue in our sermon series called More as we've been looking at how we can move from, from activity to abundance. You know, kind of like how we see in that video that, that so many of us, our lives are full with so many activities and, and, and you know, some of the activities are good and some of them are great, but, but how can we, we really move from that place of where our lives are just filled with just activity, but to that place where they're genuinely filled with the abundance that Jesus offers to us? And in the first week, we looked at how we might move to a place of surrender, where we begin to surrender our lives to God. And, and last week, we looked at how we might even begin to open up our lives to other people. And next week is Mother's Day. So again, a public service announcement. Uh, remember all, all those important women in your life. Uh, go ahead and start planning on that. Uh, reminder to myself. Uh, we'll be looking at how we can move from knowing about God to truly knowing God. But today I want to look at how we might move from activity to abundance and how we might begin to live from full to empty. And to do that, I want to look at a story from Matthew chapter 19. And we'll also have it on the screens, but Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. And it says this, Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. And Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, everyone lies. We all hide, lie, and fake, says Simon Sinek, who's a leadership uh, expert, and, and he has one of the most popular TED Talks ever with 32 million views. But he says all of us have this, this part of us that, that posture, that cover, that want to hide, that, that when we do that, we, we project these, these parts of ourselves that we want everyone else to see, and, and we do it in, in really a lot of small ways. So it, it's kind of one of those where, where you know, when when our significant other comes out and they say, hey, does this look good on me? And we say, yes, because really we just don't want to get in trouble. I mean, so this is the kind of thing that he's talking about is that we all lie and hide and fake, he says. But he says, because we all do this, we have to practice telling the truth. And so one of the things that he says that he does is he does every now and then an exercise where for 48 hours... He forces himself to tell the truth. No matter what gets asked of him, he tells the truth. He responds absolutely truthfully. So, so he shares, the, the, for instance, that he, he goes to a restaurant and, and the waiter will come by and they say, well, how's the food? And he says, well, if I'm honest, the soup's a little salty. And so he says nine times out of ten, though, that, that the chef or the maitre d' will come back out and they'll say, oh, thank you for telling us so much because everyone else will just tell us it tastes great and we never know how the soup actually tastes. We said on on one time where he was doing this 48 hours of telling the truth, no matter what, he was going to meet with the head speechwriter of the Senate majority leader. And so we went in that that one of the aides came out to receive him, and they said, how much do you know about the senator? And he said, normally in an instance like this, he would say, a little, because that's kind of what we say whenever we're we're trying to, to cover over the fact that we don't know very much, or we're trying to save face, you know, kind of, you know, have you read this book, watch this TV show, have you done some research, and, you know, when we really haven't, we kind of say, oh, a little, I've done a little bit. He said, normally I would say a little, but in this instance, because I was committed to telling the truth, I said, none, I don't know anything. And he says what surprised him is that in this instance where she could have been trying to check him out and, you know, maybe even kind of chided him and said, how do you come to meet with a senator and yet you don't do any research, you you don't, you don't study up on him or anything like that? But instead, he said the person was trying to establish their baseline. And the person told him everything that they needed to know about the senator and the head speechwriter before he went in to meet with them. And so in this way, he had all the information he needed. 
And he makes this observation. If he hadn't have been truthful that day, then he would have been less successful in that instance if he would have done what he normally did and just say, a little. And he says, yes, there was some risk involved and that sometimes that, that this doesn't work out and that, and that we always run that risk that somebody could really come at us and, and really not appreciate all of our truth telling. But he says, the reality is that for us to be who we really are, we have to be vulnerable. And I love this idea because when we think about it in our lives, especially as we think about going from, from full to empty, that really one of the keys for us to live the abundant life that Jesus is inviting us into living is that we have to be vulnerable. We have to let go of, of well, this fullness that we grab a hold of. We have to open up our hands and we have to be empty and ready to receive what God is wanting to offer to us. And that's why I love this story of the young rich ruler. And it really begins in this way, seemingly with an innocent question. Jesus, what good thing must I do to, e to inherit eternal life? But you see, it wasn't just a simple question, because as Matthew, the writer of this gospel, is telling us the story that Jesus had just sat down with, with these children and the disciples had tried to keep the children away from Jesus. And, and Jesus said, let the little ones come to me because my kingdom, the kingdom of God, belongs to these. And so it's right after that that this rich young ruler, this, this rich man who had a lot of prominence in the community, who was probably famous, who had everything, comes up to Jesus, who, who may have seen this scene in which, in which really the whole world is getting turned upside down, that, that those who, who didn't have any significance, that children were were, were, were property, they were commodities, and yet Jesus says they are the ones who are going to inherit the kingdom of God. That this man sees this, and he comes up to Jesus and he says, what good thing, teacher, must I do? You see, this really wasn't a question about heaven. He wasn't saying, Jesus, what, what do I have to do to go to heaven when I die? He's not talking about that eternal life, that essentially he's asking this question, who is it that wins in the end? Who is it that comes ahead in your kingdom? And much the same way that the disciples on one occasion said, Jesus, who of us will sit at your right and at your left when you come into your kingdom? Who is it who is most important? And so when this man comes up to Jesus and he says, what good thing must I do? He's saying, Jesus... What's the scorecard? What's the list? What are you looking for? Because I'm going to go and do those very things to earn the life that you're offering to me. And so normally when Jesus, we get a question like this, we see it oftentimes in the form of this. You know, what's the greatest commandment? That there would be times when people would come up to Jesus and they would say, Jesus, of the 613 commandments that we have in our scriptures or that we would have in our Old Testament, you know, of the 613, what's the most important? What's the one that you think is most important? What's the one that, that you would say we should live? You know, kind of what's, what's the application? What's that one thing we have to do? And, and Jesus, of course, would answer, you know, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's normally how the question gets asked. But, but the rich young ruler is after something else. And so Jesus says, why are you calling something good when you know that there is only one who is good? Jesus says you need to fix your eyes on God, first of all. And then he says, well, you know the commandments. These are the ones you ought to keep. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, this is the application you're looking for, right? And then he replies, all these I have kept. And when Mark tells the story, he adds this part, ever since I was a boy. All these I have kept since I was a boy. But he says, what is it that I lack? Which I love this question. Because if I were to be honest today, 
This is the question that I deal with the most in my life and in my heart and in my soul. Which is, God, what can I achieve? What does success look like? God, look into my life and tell me, what is that one thing I need to do so that I don't lack anything else? And Jesus looks into his life and Jesus changes the scorecard of his life and he says do you want to be perfect and I can just imagine that this rich ring ruler is like yes finally yes this is what I'm looking for what is it that I need to do Jesus says do you want to be perfect yes what's the thing what's the thing that would make me perfect that would make me successful that would make me achieve this eternal life And Jesus says, go, sell all that you have, give it away to the poor. And then he tells him, you'll have treasure in heaven. You know, he wants to let him reassure him about that. You're going to have treasure in heaven, but then come and follow me. Jesus says, if you want to enter my kingdom, you have to change how you see reality. See, if you want to enter my kingdom, that God doesn't operate like the world operates, that that this isn't a kingdom in which you can just add one more thing on and then everything is complete, that my kingdom isn't about just making yourself better and better and better and better, and then you have eternal life, then you have achieved everything, then you have everything, and then you are complete and perfect. Jesus says, no, 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 my kingdom is so much different than that. Jesus looks into his life and says, this is what you need to do. Jesus says, if you want to have eternal life, well, you need to empty your life of the things that you measure, that you find your identity and your worth in, those things that you find important so that you can be filled with the things that God finds important. You see, Jesus didn't walk around and give this invitation to everyone. Jesus didn't go around and tell everyone he encountered who had great wealth. He he didn't always tell them to go and sell everything and give it to the poor and follow him. Although we see that the early church, that they would begin to share their resources as they realized that everything was a gift from God. But Jesus didn't give this command to everybody, but Jesus gave it to this person because this is what he needed to hear. This is how he measured his life. This is what motivated him and drove him. Jesus looked into his life and said, this is what you need to do. The Bible tells us of the story of another man who was in a similar situation in Acts chapter 9. It tells us of a man named Saul who was born to the right family and, and he even studied at the right school. It tells us that when he was 14 years old that he went to study with the top teacher in Jerusalem, learning all of the religious law, re- learning all the religious duty, and he was such an exceptional student that, that he got to spend the next 10 years with this teacher. And that he was the up-and-coming young talent. The one everybody was watching for, everybody had heard of. This is the guy, Saul. He's going to be something one day. And he was about 24 years old. and, And he was in Jerusalem around the time that Jesus was in Jerusalem. And he tells us that he had everything and he had achieved everything. Every standard of his day, he had achieved it. And in fact, he was so zealous for his way. That when Jesus died and he rose again and and the disciples began to share this good news that, that this man named Saul was so zealous for the faith that he decided the best way to win was to imprison or worse to those who offered this different message. He said, I was so zealous for the faith. And in fact, the first time we see Saul that he's standing at a time in which the first person who was killed for their faith, that Saul is overseeing all of that. 
And it tells us in Acts chapter 9 that, that he goes and he asks for permission to go and to hunt down those who were followers of Jesus, whether men or women. And he gets permission and he goes on his way to Damascus. And there on his way, he says that, that he was struck down and this light came around him. And he heard this voice who said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I love this because if I was ever, you know, surrounded by light and heard this voice from heaven, I would probably, you know, answer the voice. I mean, whatever it asks, I'm probably going to say, uh, okay, um, yes, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what I'm doing, actually. So I'm glad you kind of brought this to my attention or something. But, but instead, he asked this question, and I love this, the, the audacity of asking this question, who are you, Lord? And then he hears, I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. And he says, now go into the city and wait until you receive further instruction. And this man named Saul, who had everything, who had power, who is beginning to be famous, who was zealous for his faith, was now blind. It says he was blind for three days, that he didn't eat anything or drink anything for three days, and he had to be led into the city, and he had to wait. Everything was taken from him. He was going one direction, and then with this encounter with this Jesus, he's told to go in this different direction, but it began by waiting. And I wonder today how many of us are in this season of waiting. This season where maybe our scorecard or our direction in life has changed. We begin to see everything a little differently. Or maybe the things that were most important to us, well, we find that they've just slipped through our hands. Maybe we're finding we're, we're having to reevaluate everything. Or maybe we've come up against some new knowledge, a new relationship, a new understanding of things, and it's inviting us to see life differently. You see, what we see in these two stories are, are two different ways that we move from, from a life of fullness to a life of emptiness. Maybe in the first way that, that we come to Jesus and maybe we try out you know, different philosophies, different religions, and maybe we give Jesus a try and Jesus invites us to follow him and says, this is what it looks like to follow me. You have to give up these things that are most important to you, these things that you find are, are filling you, and so you can be filled by God. Whatever those things might be, you have to let them go so that God can fill you. Or maybe we have those times where, where God just seemingly just invades our lives and we find that, that the things that are important to us aren't so important anymore and we begin to let them go or, or maybe life just seems to happen and we lose everything and we come to Jesus and we say, God, where are you? I'm waiting what are you doing in my life? You see, God wants all of us, our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. As we've looked at before, that 90% devotion to God is 10% too little. That Jesus is inviting all of us to go and to follow him. That it's in that place in which we leave everything, we empty of ourselves, that Jesus can begin to fill us with his true and abundant life. And that's why I love this question that we have in our study guide. And if you grab the inside of your study guide, one of the questions that we have for this week that you can do in your small groups or on your own, it says this, do I insist upon something that my conscience is uneasy? It's a question that invites us to see how God is moving around us already. That we don't have to wait for those moments in which life happens or, or those moments in which God invades our lives, but we begin to open up our lives to God who's around us already, who's inviting us to come to follow him. Is there anything in which we're insisting upon that we've set our life towards, that we seemingly want more than anything else, but yet there's a part of us 
And I believe that part of us that the Holy Spirit is speaking to that says, no, that's not true life. As Jesus tells us in John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says this to us, I have come that you would have life to the full, abundant life. So today, as we come to this place where we want to open up our lives to you, Lord Jesus, I would invite all of us, as we have throughout the sermon series, to be in this posture of opening up our hands. This seems to be a, a theme of this sermon series called More, but maybe whether we open up our hands or just open up our hearts, but for us to move to this place where we are open and empty before God, and we would say, God, fill us with the things that you value, with the things that, that you want for us, with the things that are most important to you so that we might have the full life that you offer to us. Will you pray with me? Jesus, as we come to you today, with our hands and our lives, our very souls open to you, we come, Lord not with full lives just to add you on, not coming looking for that one more good thing, but we come, Lord, empty, broken, ready to receive from you. So, Lord, may you speak into our hearts, may you speak into our lives, that those things that we've valued, those things that we've set up for ourselves as the most important things, Lord, may we let them go so that we may be ready to receive the life that you offer to us so that we might have the full and abundant life, the life of grace, the life of love that you offer to us. So may our hearts be open to you as we come. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.